eight-year-old belonging out here in the kindergarten, a nursery. Let's build a great big nursery for eight-year-old. But here is an eight-year-old that God chooses to be king. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign or rule. And he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. Just look at that. How God used this boy king and started him out at eight years of age and placed him as a king over a nation. Is God foolish? No, I don't think so. He's eternal. Everything he does has a reason and a purpose to it. God is not foolish. And the scripture said, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Can an eight-year-old do that that is right? I should say he can. What well, takes a brother Marlow? An eight-year-old can't. You can't expect righteousness out of an eight-year-old. You can't expect uh, an eight-year-old to understand. But here was an eight-year-old that reigned 31 years on the throne. And he wasn't but 20 when he began to clean out the idols out of Israel. Get rid of the idols. Clean out all and revive the law. Because the scripture said, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of David his father and declined neither, <coughs> neither to the right hand nor to the left. Not one counselor could stir David, I mean Josiah, the wrong way. Not one counselor on his right or on his left could lead him one way. Because that man was anointed of God. That man was led of God. Mm. See, I'd like to get rid of this thought that's among the people that there's too much discipline God wants. But I have to give up too much. Mm. Well, that's true if you want to keep your world and keep the church too. Mm. But you're going to get in trouble. Sooner or later, we get discouraged. Sooner or later, you're going to get weary because you're trying to hold to the world and hold to the church. And you're torn between the two. It's a tug of war. <clears throat> well, let's say I would do that, but I know the church is doing that. I know it should be where the church I know uh, it should be where the church is, but, 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 the world. Uh, see, the world has become very churchy and the church has become very worldly. So there's a struggle right now with people. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't, I can't get rid of that. Because if you don't, if you don't sell out, if you don't be let be one master, one master, no man can serve two masters and either hate the one and love the other. He'll hold to the one and love the other. And you will influence your children. And then you'll wonder why your children did not sell out did not give off, give up. But, see, not in every case. See, again, the shoe doesn't fit, don't wear it. Uh, but, but see, what I'm saying is that Josiah was a boy king and he did that which was right. And he neither declined to the left nor he declined to the right. But he did that which was right. And the scripture said in the 12th year, he began to purge uh, Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molded images. And he was only 20 years old when God began to use him to rid the land of the idols. So I want to use that lesson right there. That Josiah was an example of how God can take if, 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 if even a child will give themselves to him. He can guide them, lead them, form them, shape them, mold them, make them, and they will become a disciple of, of the God I serve. They will become a worker. And right now, there's so much work in the vineyard, 
I'm telling you, this church, a uh, hundred ministries can be created in this church for the people of God to work at because there's a lost and dying world. And our light must shine. That burning lamp must shine. Uh, now, now, going over uh, to uh, Matthew real quickly here, and, and I want to give you five words while I'm going into Matthew. Um, uh, purpose is a word I'd like to place in your mind, and passion, and then pride, and then principle, and then priority. Now I'll go back to those words again. Purpose, and passion, and pride, and uh, principle, and priority. These are words that uh, you try to place in your spirit, in your heart. Purpose. If I have a purpose, I need passion. Passion is the fervor or the drumbeat in my purpose to guide and lead me. Pride, that is, godly pride, is what keeps me knowing that my passion and my purpose is right. And then if I have principle, that's the foundation that causes me to know that I have godly pride in the church of the living God, in the per passion, the fervor God puts in my spirit, and then the purpose, and then last of all, I'll have priority. It starts with purpose. It, began, it, 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 it continues with the drumbeat of passion. And then I have pride. I'm lifted up in God, not my flesh. And then I live by principle. And then my priorities are right. Purpose, passion, pride, principle, and priority. Those are, those are words. But they can be translated into living in your life as a disciple of, of the Lord. Um, in Matthew, the 19th uh, chapter, there's a, there's a question that was asked Jesus. And um, in verse, uh, uh, let, let's, let's uh, use verse 27 of uh, Matthew 19. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have? There are isn't it amazing that uh, years and thousands of years go by, and, uh, but, but mankind remains the same. Basically, I'm the same. Did you know I still ask that? You ask that? I think you do. I think we all do at times, or right? We've given up. Now, what are we going to get? If you didn't say it outwardly, it was in your spirit. Lord, I, I, I've given all this up. Now, what are you going to give me? Because that's in the nature that we're trying to slay, the nature of the beast. Uh, I've, I've given all. Now, what are you going to give me? That was what Peter was saying. And that's a part of uh, of, of us by nature. It's a part of me. I've asked that question. Um, I, I've asked it verbally. I've asked it standing out in the middle of nowhere. Lord, I've done this. Now, what about it? What are you going to give me back? How are you going to help me, Lord? I've done this for you. And really, I shouldn't have been saying that at all. But I did. Because my nature spoke up. My inward self spoke up. And God didn't judge me, he didn't spike me down, because he knew that was the carnal speaking out, and he knew that was the carnal speaking out in Peter. You know, uh, I've done all of this now, where's my reward for it? So Jesus answers back, and he said, Verily, verse 28, I say unto you, that you which you have, you which have followed me, 
in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. A lot of doctrine in this. A lot of questions now. You know, there's a lot of questions here. Jesus said, ye which have followed me in my regeneration. Now that's, that's not me, because that was them. I'm following him now in my generation. They were following him in his regeneration because he was reviving the vine of Israel. Go over in the Old Testament and uh, here, pick up uh, some scripture to help you. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, which is the new re uh, in, uh, concealed, uh, but, but in Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah 2 and 21, uh, he said, uh, all right, uh, yes, verse 21, the second chapter of Jeremiah, yet I have planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine under me? That was Israel. Now, if they were a degenerate vine or degenerate plant, degenerate means a dying plant. Anything that's degenerating is dying. There's three words, degeneration, generation, and regeneration. And uh, degeneration meant that they were uh, dying. They were falling away from God. He said, but I didn't plant you that way. I planted you a noble vine, holy a right seed. Well, then how are you turned into this degenerate plant of a strange vine under me? How do you, how'd you do this? How does a church turn from uh, a generation of calls separated, and I've seen some assemblies do that, into a, how does individuals do that? Well, they degenerate instead of regenerating so they can be a new generation. Because if you degenerate instead of regenerating, you'll never be a new generation because you'll die. And he said, how did you do this, Israel? Because I planted you a noble vine, holy a right seed. Brother Barnett, if you ever as a pastor, and I know you have, I, I know pastors have you brethren around me. Have you ever had charge of the church and you looked at it and you felt like, how's this happening? How's this happening? Why, well, well, they're degenerating instead of regenerating. How's this happening? What's causing this? You try to get to the bottom of that. Let's see. What's happening to her? What's happening to him? What's happening to them? Because they should be regenerating, not degenerating. See? Because uh, have you ever watched a Christian and, and you see that? And they just retrogress. There's a word retrogress. What, what does that mean, retrogress? It means to go backwards, doesn't it? Just like progress means to go forward, retrogress means to go backward. And, and, and you'd watch that. And, and he said, how did you do this, Israel? Now let's go from Jeremiah uh, 2 and let's go to uh, Isaiah 5. So I'll get these Old Testament scriptures and, and they'll help you if you um, can concentrate with me. And I know I'm teaching now, so that's a little harder because I'm not going at it a mile a minute here, but uh, you, you know, I hope, you're, I hope I'm planting some seeds this afternoon. Hope I am. And I know when it's still, uh, you know, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't, but and I feel like this is where we need to go. And, and Isaiah 5, look, look what it says here. It says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. And keep Jeremiah 2 and 21. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. See, God is singing a song now to his beloved, which is Christ. My well-beloved Christ hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. 
And what did Christ do with Israel, this, this vineyard? And he fenced it, good, and gathered out the stones thereof, good, and planted it with a choicest vine, good, and built a tower in the midst of it. See, God not only started by Abraham's faith, Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob, then the 12 tribes, and he fenced it, gathered it all out, put a fence around it, and, and said to Abraham, I'll be your shield and your reward, and I'll let none of the nations consume you. You'll be the head, not the tail. You know, I'll multiply your fruit, vineyard, field, basket. But God did all of that. He sent the prophets, sent the prophets, built a tower, put a watchman in the tower, called the prophets, did all that. And he said, now all I look for, and I even made a wine press. I let the, I let the priesthood interpret the law and make a wine press where you could drink the wine of the Old Testament and understand the law. He said, I did all of that, and, and, and I made a wine press, and he looked that I, it should bring forth grapes. All he wanted was some grapes. Sometimes I think, my goodness, next six months, all we want is some grapes. Lord, let some fruit. Let some fruit be on the vine. All the church needs is fruit. Let fruit come on the vine. That's all God's looking for is grapes. And he, and, and, and he looked and he brought forth grapes. But the problem was they were wild grapes. My goodness. They were wild grapes. Grapes of wrath, somebody said back of me. Grapes of wrath. Steinbeck's book, wasn't it? And now, and now, O oh inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done? And I think God said that sometimes about John Marlowe. Got grapes, son? I have. I got some fruit. I got some grapes. But the problem it was wild. It was from my wild nature instead of my tame nature. I've got some. I'll bring them forth. But he said, what more could I have done to my vineyard that I have not done to it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. And so the Lord is dealing with my spirit. And I want to help. I want to be a part of you. I want you to be a part of it. And together, I want us to produce some grapes, some fruit. And it not be wild, because God couldn't do any more than he's done. He's given me life. He's helped me. He's answered my prayers. He's prospered me. He's brought me among friends. He put me in the house of God. He brought me to the body of Christ. He's healed my body. He's restored my life. He's strengthened me again and again. He picked me up, and I fell down, and he picked me up. I fell, and he picked me up. Picked me up. Brought me up. Brought me up. Brought me up again. Saved my life. Saved it again. Saved it again. What more can he do? Don't you think I ought to give him a praise? Don't you think I ought to worship him? I should, I should. Don't you think it ought to be easy for me to say, Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, none of this wild grapes. I don't want any wild grapes in the house of the Lord. When he comes to my vineyard, let it be good grapes. Because he put a watchtower in the midst of this vineyard. He's fished it. 
He's gathered out the stones. He's made a profitable place called the house of the Lord. Isn't that a lesson? Isn't that a lesson? Praise the name of the Lord. And he put a burning lamp and a smoking furnace for me as an example between me and the horror of the sleep of the law and the demise of the early church. And now here I am with this woman coming out of the wilderness, leaning upon her arms, on his arm. Praise the name of the Lord. What a lesson that is. I told I'd refer to those scriptures and let you have those. Let's go back quickly here to um, uh, to Matthew 19. I know I know what time it is, but uh, I think there's 